Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So, I'm Bill Pierce. I'm the Assistant Dean and Chief Marketing Officer and member of the marketing faculty here at Berkeley Haas. On behalf of Dean Harrison, uh, who's unable to join us today, welcome to today's uh, Dean's Speaker Series, jointly sponsored by the David Ocker Distinguished Lecture Series in Marketing. So I'm pleased to welcome the eponymous David Ocker, uh, Professor Emeritus back to Haas for this yearly event. David, we greatly thank you for doing this. Just a little bit of background. Uh, David is recognized as the father of modern branding, and is recognized as one of the top marketing strategists in the world, and is a member of the Marketing Hall of Fame. Uh, I'm sure from your classes you're familiar with the Ocker brand identity model. Uh, and additionally, uh, David's work is foundational in the field of brand marketing, but just a fraction of David's overall contribution to the field of marketing. One of the things I ask my students in class is that, you know, strive, strive to look further, try to, to move the bar farther. If you're able to see farther, it's because that you stood on the backs of giants. And I'm proud to introduce David because he is truly the giant in marketing. And, of course, one of our own. David has been on the Berkeley faculty since 1968 as the E.T. Grether Professor of Marketing and Policy Emeritus. He also serves as Vice Chair of Profit Brand Strategies, a San Francisco consulting firm founded by two Haas School alumni who were greatly influenced by his teaching and ideas, Scott Galloway and Ian Champlin, both MBA 92. Today I'm looking forward to hearing about his new book. Uh, it is called Owning Gamed, Changing Subcategories, uncommon growth in the digital age. Please join me and give David a warm Haas welcome. Welcome back, David. It's great to have you. Thank you. Well, it's nice to be here. I'm so proud of the four principles. I'm so proud of the, the rankings. I'm proud of the students. and. Uh, and uh, I was reminded today how exceptional our student body is and, and how, dis how uh, different it is from these uh, other Stanfords and Harvards of the world. Um, and I'm proud of the leadership here. So I, it's really an honor for, to be invited back to, uh, to give a talk. And I'm going to talk about my uh, book, uh, Owning Game Changing Subcategories. And it's kind of a take on innovation and growth and strategy that includes a branding uh, element to it as well, as, as you will see. So I want to talk about the four big takeaways I'd like to see people uh, come away from the book with. And before I do that, I want to start with a story. It was 2007, early October, and these two guys, Joe and Brian, were sitting in a th their three-bedroom apartment south of Market. They were designers, they were out-of-work designers. And they wondered, how are we going to make rent that was just raised? And then they thought, you know, the design conference, the global design conference is here in a few weeks. The, the, all the hotels are sold out. And uh, we've got three air mattresses. We've got an extra bedroom. We've got a, an extra living room and a kitchen. Why don't we rent them out? So they sent an email out to the bloggers in the design community. They created a very crude website. <clears throat> and they got three customers that paid $80 each for five nights, $1,200 they made the rent. So they said, well, let's, why not do it again? Let's find another sold out conference and do something similar. And they did that in Texas at the Southwest, South by Southwest conference. And then they decided to expand it beyond sold out conferences. If you, if you flash, go forward to 12 years later, they have 150 million guests, 6 million hosts, and a business value around $35 billion, 12 years. So how do they do that? Let, let's just focus on hosts. Why are hosts attracted to Airbnb and why do they maintain a relationship and a loyalty to Airbnb? 
Well, I, uh, let me talk about a couple of must-haves, that's what I call it, that, that Airbnb developed to, to connect with these hosts. The first one is they, uh, they called it um, entrepreneurial hosts. They didn't call it an owner manager that, that makes extra money by renting out a room. They called them entrepreneurial hosts. Hosts because they're really focused on, on um, making their guests have an exceptional experience. Entrepreneurial because they were willing to innovate, to upgrade their uh, accommodations, and to, uh, uh, you know, to take, take initiative. Second, the uh, Airbnb provided a lot of host support. Uh, they, from the first day, practically, they made, uh, they helped them present their accommodations better. They have best innkeeper ideas, mentorship program, online community, an annual host conference, and a few other things. So the, when the host was in the family, got a lot of support. Then they developed Airbnb experiences, where a host could leverage his passions, his knowledge, his experience to create an experience for the guests that's really over and above. You know, like maybe a hiking adventure. And then they established uh, reviews of guests and reviews of hosts. So that if hosts upgraded what they did, they'd have a way to communicate this to guests. And if hosts were uh, apprehensive about having a bad guest experience, they, they could look at reviews that other hosts had made of, of guests. Well, with that uh, background, let's turn to these four takeaways. The first one, the, my concept is that the only way to grow, it's a really strong statement, but with rare exceptions, the only way to grow is to own game-changing subcategories defined by new or markedly improved customer experiences or brand relationships. The only way to go, grow. I first came uh, uh, across this uh, a few years ago when I was in Japan, and I uh, did a lot of work in Japan over the years, and I had access to 30 years of data of Japanese beer brands. And I observed there that the, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, just a handful of times there was a surge in, in, um, in sales, it was because somebody had formed a whole new subcategory. Asahi Superdrive was one of those examples. Then I looked at the computer industry and observed the same thing there. You know, in the 70s, we had DEC, the mini computer. In the 80s, uh, Dell, build to order, and the Apple user-friendly interface. Remember the 1984 ad that Apple did um, that created a whole persona? And then in this century, we have cloud software applications like uh, Salesforce and the Amazon Web Services. And there's another uh, uh, eight or 10 or 12 I could have put up there as well. But again, every time there's a surge in sales, it's a new subcategory. I looked at automobiles. Chrysler came out with a minivan in uh, 18, or 1983. And for 15 years, they had no competition. No competition until in 1998, the Toyota Sienna came out and the Honda Odyssey. No competition for 15 years. They sold 12 million cars or something like that. Toyota Prius came out in 2001 in the US and it had enjoyed 12 or 15 years of no competition in the compact uh, uh, hybrid space. Um, and Enterprise rent a car. Uh, well, basically still has no competition. They, uh, they were under the radar until they passed Hertz in the mid-90s. And of course, Tesla has uh, got its own subcategory now. Now, uh, just an, an aside, uh, most of these brands that, that uh, own these subcategories weren't the pioneer. 
You know, uh, and, and when Chrysler came out, there was some vans in the street on trucks chassis, but there were some vans. Weren't, they weren't very popular. Um, Prius wasn't the first compact hybrid, that was Honda. Honda came out two years before Prius. Um, GM had electric, all electric car in the 90s, the EV1. So these aren't, generally, they're not pioneers, but they're the first ones to get things right. So you try to, you know, try it yourself. Pick out a category. You know, banking, clothing, the yogurt, uh, coffee, airlines, water. Pick a category and look for surges of growth that occurred in, throughout history and see if you don't agree they were caused by a new category defined by some real must-have innovations that change the customer experience and, or the brand relationship in some meaningful way. Now, the next two takeaways are, are really critical to the, uh, to the ability to create growth subcategories and engage in subcategory competition as opposed to brand competition. Incidentally, my brand is better than your brand competition almost never generates growth, almost never. And it's so not fun. Um, the first of these two are the concept of must-haves. The uh, must-haves are, are benefits, attributes, or programs that create and define growth subcategories. So a must-have is something that a customer is, uh, is very reluctant to buy an offering that doesn't have a must-have. Uh, so it's, not, it's different from nice-to-have, that you, you'd like that, but you're not going to walk, around, walk across the street to get it or pay more. Um, so let's go back to Airbnb for a minute. And we talk about these four must-haves. And I'll uh, make some observations about them. First of all, there's multiple must-haves. Almost always, we're, uh, when you look at a successful brand that has developed a subcategory, new subcategory, almost always there's four or five, six, seven, or eight of these must-haves, not just one. Um, and that was the case here. There's four. There was, there's actually more that I didn't put up, but uh, there's multiple must -haves. It, it almost never is the case that a subcategory can rest on one of them. Second, uh, uh, some of these are going to go beyond functional benefits because that's a way you really, uh, you know, can create energy, create growth, and create barriers to com competitors. And so here, entrepreneurial host, it's kind of an attitude. It's a personality. It's way beyond whatever functional uh, things that, that that implies. Airbnb experiences, there's a lot of emotion to that. I mean, you, you get to go hiking, you get to go to the Louvre with a comedian, you, you have a special experience that's going to be memorable. And uh, you compare that with having a room at the Marriott. Finally, it evolves. Now, Joe and Brian in 2007 had no idea that any of this was going to happen. This was not planned at the outset and just a matter of, of implementing it. It, it just happens. I mean, Chip Conley, the uh, hospitality guru, was hired six years after they started. And he's the one that generated a lot of these host uh, support things. And uh, experiences didn't happen until uh, four years even after that. So um, it's going to evolve. Over time, you're going to add new must-haves. You're going to improve the old ones. And, uh, and keep them uh, uh, you know, full of energy. The third takeaway, uh, you need to become an exemplar brand. Um, it, it, sometimes there's two, or, or very rarely three, but usually there's one exemplar brand. That's a brand that represents the subcategory. And that's a brand that has the, the uh, the, the power, the uh, option 
of managing that subcategory. And that means he needs to position it, uh, scale it, and create barriers. So let's take a look at job one. The, uh, the exemplar brand, if it's Tesla or Prius or, or Dell computers, they need to, they need to position the subcategory. Uh, not just the brand or the, the exemplar brand stands for the subcategory. They're, they're, uh, there's, they're one and the same or there's a huge overlap. But he needs, in, in position, that means that he has to make these must-haves prominent, visible, important. So when they think of the subcategory, they think about these must-haves. So that's the job. So salesforce.com uh, came into... Uh, into being and was one of the first software cloud computing companies. So their job was to create this category of cloud-based uh, application software. And uh, so let's look at some of the must-haves. And uh, you know, if you have a, your application in the cloud, there's nothing to buy, no investment, and nothing to maintain. Uh, somebody else is going to do it for you. Second, there's continuous upgrades. You don't have to wait every, for six months to happen to get an upgrade, which then will be very disruptive to your system. This is going to be done continuously in the crowd. You get real-time upgrades. And third, it's secure because the, uh, the cloud system has uh, a lot of expertise and put a lot of money into security and it's world class. And it's cool. It's advanced. It's not obsolete. So uh, how do you communicate all this? Well, it's a little bit hard to do it with, uh, with, with logic and uh, you know, just giving a lot of reasons why. And uh, so one of, one of the things Salesforce did was they did a lot of stunts. Like uh, when the competitor Siebel, having their annual big uh, convention show, then uh, Salesforce picketed their conference, and uh, they had a lot of signs that said, you know, software is obsolete. What they meant was that software that didn't use a cloud is obsolete. And they had fake TV uh, interviewers out there interviewing them, and they just got a lot of press from doing that. Um, so that was one of their efforts to make it visible. And when you, when you get the message that uh, uh, the, you know, that that software that's not in the cloud is obsolete and it's not cool and it's not advanced, then you, uh, you know, then it's easier for you to accept the fact that this nothing but buy and continuous upgrades that's really worth something. It's cool. Job two, scale, scale, scale. What's really important in, in creating a new subcategory is to scale it fast. Because you want to build the customer base quickly. Because the customer base is a, uh, is, consists of those people that have basic uh, inclination or affinity or need for the new subcategory. And if you can scale fast, your competitors are, are faced with either stealing customers away from you, which is going to be hard, or finding new customers that aren't as interested in this whole new subcategory in the first place. So it, it makes their uh, entree less attractive, inhibits them. And second, it solidifies your exemplar status. Because if your customers are a good chunk of the subcategory market, that really makes you as an exemplar much more credible. Well, how do you do that? Well, one, you overinvest in the uh, uh, overinvest in your marketing at the outset, and that's what, of course, Amazon has done all this year. They've in, they invested in infrastructure and in building up their operations, building up their customers, giving them extra uh, value, and uh, foregoing profits. And, uh, and uh, other companies have, have 
like Uber have sacrificed uh, have profits by having low prices at the outset, accepting losses. But they built up a customer base. Or you can lose, use social media. Uh, I think it was 2012, uh, a, a Dollar Shave Club was conceived. And it started uh, the day they launched. They launched it with a, a 90 second video. And I encourage you to watch it. You can find it on YouTube. And it's the, the founder was, it gave this video. It's very humorous, very irrelevant, uh, irreverent, and very, uh, <laughs> very irreverent, yeah. Uh, it's going to be sad if that's my only joke that, that got a laugh. Um, um, and it was, it was really outrageous and fall down funny, and it went viral. They got, in two days, 48 hours, they got 12,000 members of the Dollar Shave Club. 12,000 members in two days. Um, and it's all about the humor and, and the outrageousness and how well it was done. And it cost $4,500. Now, to be fair, the CEO was a comedy writer. So if you didn't have a CEO like that, you'd have to pay one. It might cost 30, 40, 50,000, but that's still. You know, it didn't cost $10 million. It's still really cheap. Now, I was going to play you that ad, but it's got some uh, really sh shock value words in it. And I thought, this is maybe not to say their target audience. So I'm going to pay, play a couple of ads that follow that. But you get the flavor. You'll meet the CEO, and you'll see how they, they communicate these must-haves and elevate them in people's minds. Um, and they do it with such humor and outrageous stories. <laughs> Hi, can you open the razor case, please? Auto ID. I'm just grabbing some razors. Grabbing? Put your index finger in there, sir, please. I just need to get in a case. Why do you need to get in the case so bad? So I can buy some razors. It's almost like they don't want you to buy their razors. Well, I want you to buy mine. DollarShaveClub.com delivers amazing razors for just a few bucks. Ah! <laughs> hey, one pack of razors, please. Comes to 1965. What? That's a lot. Yeah, I don't. Comes with a free gift. Oh, free gift. That's cool. <laughs> Tired of getting beat up by high razor prices? DollarShaveClub.com ships amazing razors for just a few bucks. Oh, free gift. So that's Dollar Shave Club, and um, um, and that's how you know social media has has. Uh, really created overnight a, uh, a new subcategory for Dollar Shave Club and some other ones. Let's look at job three, to build barriers. Um, so if we don't build barriers, we haven't really in the end accomplished that much. We've already seen two of them. One barrier is the strength of the must have. So if you do your positioning right, the exemplar brand is going to be so connected to these must haves that that's where you go to get them. And the uh, base of uh, loyal uh, customers, you, when you scale, you create this base of loyal customers, as I've already suggested. That's a huge barrier. But you could also brand the innovations. Uh, that's what he, uh, Uniqlo did with Heat Tech and Aerism. These are branded fabric innovations of Uniqlo that you really can't get anywhere else. And you can engage in continuous innovation, become a moving target. And that's what Prius did. Every two years, they'd have new or improved must-haves. And it makes it hard to compete. It's another barrier. OK, the final takeaway, and that is the digital, the digital impact. So what digital has done, you know, first of all, this, this theory about subcategories, I think, works 
40 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. However, the digital uh, era, the last 10 or 20 years, it puts game-changing subcategory on steroids. There's now a lot more of them. I mean, you know, orders of magnitude more, not just 10% more. They grow faster, and they have a higher upside. I mean, Dollar Shave Club sold their, their business for a billion dollars four years after they started it. Um, and without digital, it wouldn't have happened. So let me talk about four ways that digital has impacted this whole concept of subcategory creation and competition. First of all, the digital advances, we call it the Internet of Things. You know, just look at Internet users. In 14 years, it, it went up a factor of four. Smartphone users went up by a factor of nine in 10 years. Uh, look at the advances of GPS in the last 10 or 20 years, and voice recognition as well. Voice recognition just 10 years ago was pretty crude. And then look at the smart world, the smart car, the smart factory, the smart home, where you can ask Alexa to play the morning playlist or, or whatever. I mean, Alexa didn't even exist six years ago. And in, in their first four years, they got 40 million installations in the US. I mean, the digital world is so different. The opportunity to do so many things you couldn't do then. I mean, you, we can now do Uber. We can now do Nest uh, ther uh, thermostats. There's, and look at the car of, of Tesla. Tesla is, is all about digital must-haves. And um, you, know, you, can, you can look up what's the nearest uh, station to charge the batteries. What's the, yeah, you can, it's, it's just amazing what digital has done. Uh, to give people opportunities. And then there's e-commerce. You know, it wasn't too long ago. It really wasn't. It, you know, two decades at the most. Where if you had a new idea, a new product, you needed to hire a personal sales force. Or you had to find a way to get into retail stores. Or you had to create a whole new chain of retail stores. Can you imagine the cost and the time that it took to do that? And now we've got e-commerce. And look at the, the different levers you have with digital and e-commerce. Take the Dollar Shave Club, for example. You've got this feisty underdog persona with, with humor and irreverence. Um, you've got simplified choice. You know, where Amazon's got 12,000 choices, uh, Dollar Shave Club's got three. You know, low, medium, high. And, uh, to, and because of its e-commerce, you don't have a warehouse, you don't have a lot of things like that, you can deliver, you have a lower, lower cost structure. So you can compare cost versus Gillette's that being sold in drugstores. And uh, take another example, uh, Casper. Casper actually doesn't make mattresses, it sells better sleep. They've got a higher purpose. It's about sleep. And one of the things they do is they have a sleep channel where you can hear different sounds that are comforting, make you go to sleep. You can have, you can uh, do fairy t hear fairy tales, some of them which are described as being not very good, but they'll put you to sleep. And uh, uh, so uh, that's something that it's, it's harder for somebody to do that's being distributed in a drugstore or, uh, uh, or so forth. Third is digital communication. Again, it wasn't too long ago if you had a new concept or new product, you needed an advertising campaign and a media buy. And this is, it was very expensive and it took a lot of time to do it. Um, and look at what we have today. We have email and social media, for example, all uh, hinging around the concept of the share button. And that's what makes it work. I mean, 
there was some famous uh, people in, in uh, sociology writing in the 50s that talked about, you know, personal influence. Katz and Lazarfield were their names. And, and they talked about the power of one person talking to another. But in their research, a person would have three contacts, maybe a dozen, maybe even two dozen. But now, a person can have hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of contacts, and just through the click of a share button. And so that's why this is such wildly different. If you look at Airbnb, I mean, they started by emailing these design bloggers. And if you look at social media, uh, Dollar Shave Club got these 12,000 new subscribers by having a video that went viral. Um, and there's websites. And websites is a way to, to put a lot of information very conveniently at the tips of customers. They can search and find it, and they can get a lot of information. And if you craft your website right, it's going to be really easy to use and powerful. And it can express yourself. It can, it can do more than just tell you about your offering and help you order it. It can show your personality. It can show your values. I mean, look at Patagonia website, for example. It's all about the values of Patagonia and what's important to them. Um, and then there's uh, brand communities, which is, uh, which I think is uh, an, a little, uh, it's not as understood as it should be because it's a really powerful, powerful device. So what is a brand community? It's a group of people that bond with a shared involvement, even passion, with activities, issues, or interests, with the focal point being the exemplar brand and its website and social media. So it's a group of people that bond over a shared involvement or a passion with activities, issues, and interests, or interests. And it's just so powerful because it, it, it creates a, uh, for a person, first of all, social benefits. He's now part of a group. And in, in, in many cases, these groups are active where he's an active, involved part of a group. And... Uh, uh, and, and, he, and it's a way for them, him to connect with the exemplar brand that you just can't do any other way. You, you can't do it by just talking at them or running ads or something. This is, this is something where he's, he's really or she is really involved. Um, and, uh, and anybody, you know, a wide variety of brands can do this. B2B brands can do this. I mean, Salesforce.com has got a brand community around people that are using Salesforce software. And they want to ask questions, they want to try out ideas, and they want to communicate with others in the same boat. And they want to compete with experts from Salesforce. Now, you know, brand communities is, is not, you know, just didn't spring up overnight. Uh, we've, we've had brand communities for a long time, but they've often been restricted to charismatic brands. Um, and one of them, of course, is the, the Harley Owners Group, Hogs. And they've been existed since the early 80s, and they're groups that basically bond around taking motorcycle trips and, and hearing about trip routes and hearing about trip experiences and sharing them. And... Uh, but, you know, if you compare the Harley Owners Group with the 80s with what it is today, when they have a website and social media, it's so much easier to broaden it. It's so much easier to deepen it than it was then. So we now have, uh, you know, uh, a wide variety of brands that have really done well with brand communities. And incidentally, if you have a boring brand, you might have a, uh, a really good social program that has some energy, and you can have a brand community around that. 
I mean, that's what Life Boy did with its Help a Child Reach Five program, and and a bar soap. And um, anyway, the, one of the communities that's been really successful is Sephora, the beauty insider community. Real people, real time, real talk, beauty inspirations, ask questions, get recommendations. And that's an enormous successful community. And it's really <coughs> been one of the vehicles that has enabled Sephora to uh, do as well as it's have. And then th think about Etsy, which is a, a really a, a, a amazing uh, company. And it's all about crafts. And, and the people that make crafts bond around Etsy. The people that buy crafts and, and own crafts bond around Etsy because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's them. It's everything they're passionate about. It's how they spend their time. It's what they're interested in. And at Etsy, they're sort of in pig heaven. So that's it. You know, this is a, the digital has really enabled a lot of subcategory creation and growth. Digital advances, uh, e-commerce, digital communication, and brand communities. And, uh, and they, they've really enabled and supported the idea of subcategory, game-changing subcategories as the only way to growth. And, uh, and again, to do that, you have to understand how to create and manage and evolve must-haves and how to become the exemplar brand to position, to scale, and to build barriers. So that's it. Do we have some, uh, maybe we have time for questions? So you, any questions on anything is fine with me. There are, there are microphones on both aisles. So if you have a question, if you could queue up, uh, use the microphone. And I'll prime the pump. David, how about that? Sure. Uh, how many books have you written? Oh, about 17. OK, so what's your inspiration? Like, what, where's the core idea? I want to explore this. I want to go deeper on this. I want to transmit knowledge in this. Where does, where does that well, come from? Well, what, what most people do is uh, they figure out what the market wants, and then they try to build a product to, to fill that. That's what I teach, but that's not how I do things. I write books because a topic catches my eye, and I'm really fascinated about it. I want to write a book about it. And, uh, and so I, I don't pay any attention to whether anybody wants that book or not. Um, so that's what I did. I, in the early days, I wrote some textbooks. I wanted to learn market research. I wanted to learn advertising. I wanted to learn strategy. So I wrote a book on each of them. Really inefficient way to learn. Um, and then I got into branding. And uh, in my strategy work, I came to believe that people didn't take a, were too short-term oriented. And, and that was hurting them. It was hurting everybody. And we needed to build assets instead of get short-term profits. And, and then I looked around, and I thought, gee, the asset I'm most uh, suitable to, to help them with is brands. So that's how I got into branding. And then I started writing branding books. And I just think branding is a fascinating subject. It's, uh, it's closely tied to strategy, but it uh, um, it's really make or break for a lot of companies. I have to say about branding, it's the difference between being a commodity and being a product. So for the students that we have here in the audience, for the folks that work around house in the audience, what advice can you give them on their career of how to be a brand, not a commodity? How do they, how do they separate themselves from their competition? Oh, that's a really interesting question. My daughter. Uh, who is continuously giving me advice, has long said, I need to write a book on personal branding, because that's what everybody's interested in. And I keep saying, I have nothing to say. And she said, don't worry about that. Just write a book. <laughs> um, um, but actually, I have a, uh, a chapter here and there on personal branding. And it, it's true that. Um, there's a lot, it, just like a company, there is a, I mean, you can drift along without uh, letting, with, with your brand being in, placed in charge of advertising people that just try to make it visible. 
But um, it really makes sense to actively manage it, to figure out what you want to stand for. And you might have a, a professional brand and a personal brand. What do you want yourself to stand for in your colleagues? And what do you want it to stand for in your family? And then, uh, then assess that and say, well, where, which of these areas am I there? And I go already doing that, and, and I can leverage that. And what are the areas that I need to change or improve? And then you say, how, how can I do that? I mean, it's just logically going to help. Uh, it just makes sense. But. Um, it takes a little introspection, and it's not fun sometimes. Um, and, um, and so few people do it, but, but more should. Ready? Hi, thanks for coming. Just a quick question. You touched upon this a little bit. Curious to see where you see the biggest differences between B2B and B2C on this framework. Yeah. Um, I think that there's more similarities than differences. I mean, the process you go through to create and manage a brand and build it are very similar. But in general, in a uh, B2B case, what, you, norm, what you, you have to elevate, usually, the organization. And so you have a lot of organizational uh, things. Because in a B2B case, you're having a relationship with an organization. You want to have faith that that organization is going to deliver reliably. You want to have faith that it's going to innovate and be on top of the, of the game so you're not getting stuff that's, that's not the best. And uh, so to do that, the best way to do that is not to tell people, don't worry, we're reliable. Don't worry, we innovate. We're innovators and we're reliable innovators because that's not... So the, the way to do that is to... Communicate your values and your culture, and to do it, incidentally, do it by stories. I, my last book was creating signature stories, and I'm a big fan of stories. But, um, but yeah, so in a B2B case, you're much more likely to talk about an organization. Also in a service business, you're more likely to talk about the organization. Whereas if you're in a B2C case that's not service, you're more likely to uh, to to, uh, to maybe to have a brand personality uh, of some kind or some ways to link with the uh, product. Maybe you have a social program that would link. Uh, so that's the main difference. So B2B and service, you really need to, uh, or at least the people that are successful at, at uh, communicating values and culture and process and programs are, are successful. Thank you. Dave, you have one over there. Um, Professor Acker, uh, great lecture, thank you. Um, my name is Akshay, I'm in the EW class of 2020. My question is specifically, if you're not an exemplar brand in an established industry, how do you compete with the exemplar brand, uh, knowing full well that they can apply the same strategies that you can? Yeah. The, um, it's a big disadvantage because uh, the way you become relevant is basically to say that you're like the exemplar brand. Because if you don't, you're not relevant because th that's what they're buying, right? So, um, the, uh, the, so that's what you have to do. You say that we're as relevant as we're, we do everything the exemplar brand does. And maybe try to say we do this one thing a little better. And at, uh, if you're aggressive, then you can actually say, well, we're going to take this subcategory they created and take um, and, and replace it with another subcategory that's, that's this one with a, a still another must have that they don't have. So you create your own subcategory. And then you have a battle of subcategories. And you try to make them irrelevant because they lack one, this new must have that you've put out there. Um, so that's what you do. Yeah. Hey, thanks for coming. Uh, as we see the world continue to get more and more digital, um, how do you think about branding over the next five, ten years? What, what do you think the kind of changes in that are going to be like? Um, well, I think t my advice for people that ask me what uh, 
what they need to do to succeed in branding is, is uh, uh, two things. One, I think they, that what works is to get beyond functional benefits and to, um, you know, get into things like values and culture and personality and so forth and, uh, and social programs. The second thing is to uh, have a, a higher purpose, especially a social environmental higher purpose like Casper is in a sleep instead of mattresses. And, um, and that's a way to connect and become credible. And, and if you can do that better than others, then, um, and, and digital is, you know, helps you do that. And the third thing is to use stories. And instead of describing programs, instead of telling facts and figures, you tell stories and let that, uh, you know, let that carry the message. Yeah. Thanks, sir. Hi, thanks again for coming. Um, my question is related to the last bullet of your framework where you talk about the different um, digital channels that we now have to reach our customers. And my question for you is, are you, are you suggesting that those different channels then in turn create new subcategory opportunities? Or is it that the subcategories can now leverage those new channels? Which direction is it, and what can we do about that? No, no, th this, this enables the uh, subcategories to, to scale, it enables them to communicate must-haves. So it's a, it, it's a, uh, uh, it's rarely a, a it, uh, in and of itself, a, a must-have, or it's, it rarely defines the, Subcategory, I guess e-commerce, uh, in some respects, does. But no, it's it's a way to communicate the subcategory and the exemplar brand, and to distribute it. And um, in the case of Internet of Things, it's the case of, of finding new must-haves. But the uh, the e-commerce and the social media are a way to access the market. Yes, thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, when it comes to telling stories and for branding, um, my question is, let's say you're a pre-existing company and you haven't really taken that path in terms of marketing, you know, you were more functional. Um, how do you balance sincerity versus just knowing what might sell um, when you're, you know, designing these stories or when you're trying to communicate these? And how does that affect the people who work in that pre-existing company when you start telling these stories? Well, the stories have to be credible, and they have to be uh, um, uh, the the, um, the way you tell whether a story is is going to work or not is uh, you ask the uh, the following question: um, Is it is it perceived? As, is it uh, is it phony? And you want to have, tell stories that don't, aren't perceived as being phony. And um, uh, you also want to, um, let's see, have, well, you just want stories that, that are, are uh, authentic. And, uh, and if you do get stories that are phony or, and not authentic, then you're, you know, they're going to backfire on you. Oh, and you, you also want stories that are not, they don't get the reaction as they're selling me something. You want to have them get involved in the story and be interested in the story and not think that this is just a sales job. Their, their motivation is to sell me something. And so, uh, now, for example, you, you look at these Dollar Shave ads, I mean, they're definitely trying to sell you something, right? But in that case, you don't get that reaction from people because the humor distracts them from counter-arguing. So they're all wrapped up in the humor, and they don't say, oh, he's trying to sell me razor blades. And so uh, that's a really great advantage of humor. Uh, it distracts. It's also a good advantage of a warm emotional story that involves. They get they they think about the story and they don't think, oh, it's a sales sales job. I think we have time for one more, Dave. Okay. 
So, um, those of us who've been in Bill's class have heard all about blue ocean strategies. Um, as you think about creating new subcategories and must-haves, is there a particular approach or, or structure to how to think about creating those new opportunities? Say that again. <laughs> so when, when identifying a new subcategory, uh, like where you want to be the exemplar brand, is there a specific way that you would recommend thinking about what are those must-have attributes to make sure that we oh, are stressing so we yeah. can create this new subcategory? Yeah, there's a, a chapter in the book on finding must-haves. And the short answer is that um, you just look anywhere. And the book talks about 13, 12 or 13 different sources. It can come from customer search. It can come from failed brands in the past. Uh, you could look at uh, you know, the Apple iPod was, was preceded by a Sony product two years ago. So Apple could say, well, that Sony product was a good idea. They just didn't do it well. We could do it well. So, so there, there's a, uh, uh, there's, but there's two general sources of ideas. One comes out of technology and product and, and so forth. How can we uh, do things differently, improve the product? And how can we exploit our technology and expertise? And the other comes from the marketplace. And it says, what are the customer's pain points? How could we uh, address them? And, uh, and so forth. But within both those categories, there's, there's dozens of sources. And so um, the, the, the successful companies are those that can access a whole bunch of different sources. They have a, a mechanism that does that. David, I, I, David, I want to thank you for coming. Uh, back to campus today. It's such a treat to have you here. Uh, the students and the folks around Haas just get a tremendous uh, experience, insight, things that they can do different and better going forward. And it's just a gift that you give the community. And we just want to say thank you. So thanks oh. very much. My pleasure. My pleasure. Getting to talk to you about marketing is like going to Rome and talking to the Pope. So thanks again, and uh, we'll see you at the next Dean Speaker Series. Thanks, everybody.